But most importantly to me, Catherine is genuine. She's genuine in her love for God, her love for her fellow human beings, her love for this world in which we live. We are told to be winsome in our communication with others. I don't know how to define that word, but I've seen it. It's Catherine. She gives endlessly of herself. She volunteers her time in countless ways. She lives life with a smile on her face. We're honored to have her speak to us tonight. Please join me in welcoming professor in the Department of Political Science, director of the Climate Science Center at Texas Tech University, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. Thank you, Tom, for that kind introduction. I took piano for 14 years. <laughs> I enjoy playing piano, and I still do today. But the recitals and the Royal Conservatory exams that I had to endure as part of those, that, those studies are some of the most horrifying and traumatic experiences of my young years. So listening to this incredible performance tonight inspired awe, amazement, and a little tinge of envy. <laughs> the magnificent composition and the skill of the musicians in turning that into life was just incredible. So thank you so much. That was just absolutely inspirational. <laughs> I also want to thank Tom for his kind introduction. When I was a young scientist um, entering the field, uh, Tom was already at the top. And the fact that there was a leader in the field who was not only renowned for his science, but also for his commitment to his faith was an inspiration and an example for me. And then lastly, I want to thank my undergraduate research advisor who I have not seen until today since that day. I last saw Jim Drummond when he was advising me where to go to graduate school, and he said to me, and I will never forget, he said, you cannot study climate modeling unless you believe in it because it is a religion. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jim, I did end up studying climate modeling, but you'll be happy to know that about a third of what I do is kicking the tires and trying to figure out what's actually wrong with the models first. So this is an amazing experience tonight to be able to speak to you, and I'm going to be talking about, as it says up here, climate science and Christians, and our culture. Now, there's a lot of science, science people and scientists in the audience. So let me just give me your hand if you're a scientist. I want to see how many. Okay, see, this is an above average number of scientists here tonight. So, all good scientists know you have to ask people questions. Here's your first question. How old is climate science? Is it about 50 years old? Is it about 200 years old? Did it start when Jim Hansen famously testified to Congress about the dangers of global warming in 1988, or was it invented by Al Gore? <laughs> <laughs> Register your answer mentally. The correct answer is B, about 200 years, yes. It's been 200 years since Joseph Fourier, who was famous for many things, including his time series, it's been 200 years since he figured out the reason why the planet is not a frozen ball of ice. We should be over 30 degrees Celsius colder than we are today if it weren't for this incredible atmosphere we have that traps the Earth's heat like a blanket, keeping us at just the perfect temperature for life. When did he do that research? In the 1820s. By the 1850s, John Tyndale, a British scientist, had figured out specifically what gases were responsible, water vapor, carbon dioxide, and methane. There's growing recognition, and in fact, there's a symposium happening down at UC um, Santa Barbara tomorrow, um, that John was not the only person studying this at this time. In fact, there was an American woman called Eunice Foote, who was an amateur scientist and also an advocate for women's rights, who wrote a paper on her experiment, and it was presented at the 1856 meeting of the, of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. 1856, in which she actually speculated, believe it or not, that an atmosphere of carbon dioxide would give our Earth a higher temperature. 
In other words, in 1856, she was saying that if we increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we would expect our temperature to go up. Isn't that crazy? Tyndall went even further. Tyndall was the first to connect the dots between the fact that human activities were altering the balance of these gases in the atmosphere. Even though back then we weren't producing hardly any of them, in subsequent years the amount of carbon we were producing has grown and grown. It's grown so far now that in fact the original amount of carbon that we had in the atmosphere that was absorbing the Earth's heat energy and then re-radiating it in all directions, that original amount of carbon dioxide has increased by almost 50% today, and the amount of methane has increased by over 150%. We know today that this is the reason why, even though our Earth's temperature goes up and down from year to year, because that's just weather, we know that this is the reason why, long-term, decade after decade, the temperature of the Earth is warming. But back in 1938, Guy Callender, born in Canada, moved to the UK when he was four years old. Guy Callender, using nothing more than this part of the data set, which he personally collected by writing to people who kept weather stations around the world, he published a paper on the artificial production of carbon dioxide and its influence on temperature, in which he showed that, yes, the temperature of the Earth was rising and carbon emissions were responsible. We know today that our choices matter, that if we continue in the future to produce large amounts of carbon dioxide versus if we transition to clean sources of energy that do not produce carbon, we know that our future will look very different. But the results that we get from our most up-to-date climate models today are humblingly and amazingly similar to what Arrhenius, a Swedish chemist, got in 1890 when he calculated the first climate model by hand. It took him two years. Around Christmas the first year, his wife packed up and left. (laughs) He got off lucky. Poor John Tyndale was poisoned by his wife. (laughs) He had trouble sleeping later in life, and his wife would give him chloral at night to help sleep, and one night she accidentally... (laughs) Yes, we're calling it accidentally. She accidentally upped the dose, and apparently his last words were, Louisa, you have killed your John. Since Arrhenius, we've known that our carbon choices matter because he actually calculated how much the world would warm if we doubled or tripled levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. He thought it would take thousands of years. He didn't realize we were looking at exponential, not linear growth. So we've known for more than 100 years that Trace gases in the atmosphere are the thermostat of our planet controlling our temperature. That digging up and burning massive amounts of coal and gas and oil produces more of these heat-trapping gases. We know that that's the primary reason why the planet is warming, and we know that the future is in our hands. We've known this for a very long time. We also know that when we look at the common arguments we hear, isn't it just a natural cycle? It's all the sun's fault anyways, isn't it volcanoes? We know that if it were the sun, we'd be getting cooler right now, not warmer, because the sun's energy's been going down, not up. We know it can't be natural cycles that just move heat around the Earth's system because the entire planet is warming, the ocean, the atmosphere, the land surface, and the ice. We know it can't be the orbital cycles that cause the ice ages because according to orbital cycles, we should be getting cooler right now, not warmer. And the latest report that we just published uh, for the U.S. government, the National Climate Assessment, included this figure where it showed the influence of human factors. That's the red. I know the, the font is a little bit tiny here. The red is the influence of human factors. The tiny little orange bar is the long-term influence of the sun over the past 150 years. And the green is the influence of volcanoes. Now, if you're not familiar with this resource, there is a fantastic resource called Skeptical Science, and they've actually organized all the but what about questions you've ever heard about climate change, and they've ranked them by how frequently they occur on the internet. So the top one occurs 4.3% of the time, and that says climate's changed before, so today's no different. If you click on each of these, it gives you a great answer with links to the original scientific articles as well if you want to dig really deep. One of the most frequent things we hear, though, and this is a study by Naomi Oreskes. I like to show people's pictures so you know who's talking here. 
One of the most frequent accusations we get, though, is that we're being alarmist. We're exaggerating this. Why? Because we want attention or money or we just like to exaggerate. Who doesn't? Not scientists. So what they did was they added up 20 years' worth of projections from 1990 to 2010, and then they looked at what had actually happened, and I expected them to find, as a scientist, I expected them to find that some studies were a little too high and some studies were a little too low, but I expected them to find that there was no net bias because we are taught to be unbiased. That's not what they found. They found that we as a community are biased. The available evidence, the paper went on to say, suggests that scientists have been conservative. And conservative isn't the way engineers mean conservative. For engineers, if you're building a bridge and you want to be conservative, you take the worst case scenario and you multiply it by two or four or ten if you're really conservative. Conservative for a climate scientist is the opposite. It means least amount of change, best case scenario. And so this paper concluded that scientists are biased towards cautious estimates where we define caution as erring on the side of less rather than more alarming predictions. And it was so systematic that they coined a phrase, a syndrome, ESLD. Far from being drama queens, we are exactly the opposite. We are anti-drama queens, erring on the side of least drama. Yet even though the science is so old, and even though the tires have been thoroughly kicked, we still, every week, could go online or listening on the radio or watching on TV, and we could hear people saying, the climate science is not settled. We don't know enough yet to make decisions. And we see all kinds of information. This is information from one media outlet, the Wall Street Journal, how much of the information on climate science that appeared in their opinion pages was actively, demonstrably misleading, 81%. That's why, even though well over 97% of climate scientists agree that it is real, it is us, and it is serious, when you ask the public, the public thinks we're pretty much 50-50 on this. Why? Because when you turn on the TV, you see two talking heads yelling at each other. If somebody wants to do a debate, they have one person saying it's, it's a big deal, and the other person saying it's not. You think it's 50-50. The reality is, is that there's tens of thousands of peer-reviewed scientific studies establishing the fact that it isn't natural cycles, it isn't volcanoes, it really is humans, it really is happening, and the impacts are serious. Now, there are some peer-reviewed studies that say that it isn't happening, or that it isn't us, or that it isn't serious. And so three years ago, we took 38 of those papers, there weren't a lot of them. There were certainly not thousands of them. We took 38. And we, and when I say we, I actually mean my colleague Rasmus Benestad and the rest of us helped. We recalculated each one of those 38 studies from scratch. 38 studies whose results opposed the conclusion that climate is changing and or that humans are responsible. You know what we found in this replication study? It stunned even me we found that there could be at least one error identified in every single paper. And when that error was identified and corrected, it would bring the results in line with the 200 years of scientific consensus. So as my colleague Ray Pierre Humbert from the University of Chicago wrote in response, he said, climate science is settled enough. Why? Because we're not talking about cutting edge physics. The nonlinear fluid dynamics and the thermodynamics and radiative transfer that form the basis of our understanding of climate science, we have understood that physics since the 1800s. And that is the same physics that powers our stoves, our fridges, our airplanes, and many more aspects of human life. And you don't find a lot of blogs, you don't find a lot of politicians who are saying that airplanes do not fly and fridges aren't real. You can find anything on the internet, so I bet you could find one. <laughs> but it's not really a part of our, our everyday dialogue. When we published the Climate Science Special Report this past November, part of the US National Climate Assessment, 
You can find it online at science2017.globalchange.gov. It was and is still the most comprehensive and up-to-date assessment of the state of climate science today. It'll be another number of years until we get a new Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report out, and so this is currently the most up-to-date assessment. It's got 477 pages, it's got 51 authors, it was written and reviewed by 12 federal agencies. It was reviewed by the National Academy of Sciences who wrote a book. Yes, you think you got it bad when you get a paper back and you get a long reviewer comment? We got a book back, 130 page book that we had to respond to with a special review editor assigned to each chapter to make sure we answered every single sentence in that 130 pages. But despite the fact that this report is cutting edge, despite the fact that it has the latest information on sea level rise and Antarctic melt rates and um, how the, what we know about distant climate in the past can help us understand the future, despite that, we can summarize this report in one sentence that John Tyndale and Eunice Foote could have said in the 1850s. And that sentence is, it's real, it's us, it's serious, and the window of time to prevent serious impacts is closing fast. So at this point, those of us who adhere to the scientific method, who say, okay, give me the data, let me look at the data, looks like there's a lot of data, at this point we might be saying, case closed, right? Well, if you poll people across the United States and you say, do you think that global warming is mostly being caused by human activities? And let me just add here, mostly, actually, it's between 95% and over 130% is being caused by humans. Why? Because natural factors are causing us to cool right now. So asking is it mostly caused by humans is actually kind of a softball. When you ask people that in the US, this is what you get. Anything that is blue is less than 50% of people saying yes. Anything that is orange is more than 50% saying yes. Now, I know there's some people thinking, oh, but that's the US. <laughs> I've got Canada, and it ain't pretty. Now, the same group did this, but they asked a slightly different question. For Canada, they said, do you think the Earth is getting warmer mostly? And then they asked them, partly or mostly? So when you say partly or mostly, it looks a little better, doesn't it? But if you ask mostly, it does not look good, except in some parts of Quebec. <laughs> So as scientists, we think, if they just knew the facts, they'd change their minds, right? Maybe we need to write another report. <laughs> you had colored graphics in the last one, but they were not animated. <laughs> Maybe if you did some little videos to accompany it. This assumption is based on the idea that people are blank slates, that they're just waiting for us to come along and write the right information on, and they'll say, oh, okay, and that's what they'll believe. What I love and appreciate about the social sciences, about studying how we as humans interact with our world and with information, is that they can ask these questions and they can test them. And so Dan Cahan from Yale tested this exact question. He said, public apathy over climate change is often attributed to a lack of comprehension. People don't know enough science. We conducted a study to test for this and we found no support. People with the highest degree of science literacy were not most concerned, they were most polarized. We are not blank slates when it comes to climate change. So then you might say, well, but surely if they saw it with their own eyes, they'd change their minds, right? And these little cartoons come from our global weirding videos on YouTube. If you're not familiar with them, these super short little five minute videos on YouTube, just Google global weirding, not warming, weirding. And each one starts off with a question that you might have heard. So if they just saw it with their own eyes, surely they changed their minds, right? Because Hurricane Harvey, over a hundred billion dollars worth of damage. Puerto Rico, even three months after Maria went through, half of Puerto Rico was still without power. Entire Caribbean islands completely decimated to the point where the Prime Minister of Dominica said to the United Nations in November, to deny climate change is to deny a truth we have just lived. 
So Larry Hamilton, another social scientist, said, I'm going to ask people this, this past fall, do you think recent extreme weather adds to the evidence of climate change? Now, this survey was done in the U.S. He asked people to self-identify themselves politically as well. If you're liberal or mostly liberal, between 80 to 90 percent of people said yes. And the reality is, is that the changes that we see happening to the characteristics of hurricanes are exactly what we expect due to basic physics in response to a warming world. If people were moderate, fittingly, they were 50-50. <laughs> but you can guess where this is going, right? Moderate, conservative, and conservative were about 35 down to 25 percent. You might say, okay, but Larry was not polling people specifically in Houston. He wasn't. I've put him in touch with people so maybe he could do some polling in Houston. I would love to see that, but he wasn't. He wasn't polling people specifically in Puerto Rico. But Larry lives in New Hampshire, and he said, all right, well, I have a great sample of New Hampshire people, and this past January, we had a very warm January in New Hampshire. So in this state, we had an extremely warm January. We've had a handful of very warm Januaries over the past 20 years. So in February, he asked people in New Hampshire whose own backyard thermometers had measured the warm January. He said, do you think January was warmer than normal? What happened? He broke the answer out by who they had voted for in the election. <laughs> And there was one number that was significantly lower. So at this point, we scientists who operate on data and facts, we're probably feeling a little bit like this inside our heads. <laughs> what is going on, number one, and what can we do about it if personal experience and facts aren't changing people's minds? So those are the two things that I'm going to talk about. Why is this happening? And what can we do about it? There are so many barriers to accepting and acting on climate change that I can't even list them all here, so please do not take this list as comprehensive. There are more that could be added, but I'm going to highlight a few of the most important ones. The first barrier is simple logics, logistics. We are all beneficiaries of the Industrial Revolution. We would not be sitting here today if it were not for the tremendous benefits that the Industrial Revolution brought us by mechanizing labor so we did not lead short, brutal lives anymore. If you were at the top of the food chain back in those days, you might have a better life, particularly if you weren't a woman. But back then, if you were not, your life was not what it would be today. We have benefited enormously from the Industrial Revolution in many ways that underlie every single aspect of society today. It is really hard to transition rapidly when what we're transitioning off of pervades every aspect of society. When scientists identified the ozone hole and they identified what was causing the ozone hole, it was specific chemicals that occurred in spray cans, in air conditioning refrigerants, and even in Nike Air shoes. The world acted quickly. They reduced and eventually eliminated the most dangerous chemicals. They came up with replacements, and the ozone hole is just now starting to recover. That is a dawdle in the park compared to the logistical issues of weeding out the fossil fuel use throughout our society. We're not asking for a small change. There's economic barriers. What type of economic barriers do I mean? Well, if you go to Wikipedia and you look for the 10 most wealthy companies in the world with the largest revenue, here's the 10 for 2017. Five of them are petroleum companies. Five out of 10 of the richest companies in the world are petroleum companies. Two more of them are vehicle companies that are predicated on burning fossil fuels. If fossil fuels did not exist, Toyota and Volkswagen would not be on this list. Berkshire Hathaway has large amounts of investment in fossil fuels, and that leaves only Walmart and Apple. Google the headlines for Walmart this year, and what do you find? Walmart aims to generate half its energy from renewable sources by 2025. 
Google the headlines for Apple this past month. Apple is now globally powered 100% by renewable energy and nine more Apple suppliers come online as well. The money is in the hands of organizations that have an absolute vested interest in maintaining the status quo as long as possible because every single year that goes by with us continuing to be dependent on fossil fuels as our primary source of energy is another year that they have succeeded in meeting their bottom line. But there's more to it than that. And I think the psychological ones are actually some of the most interesting ones. What are just a few of the psychological barriers to understanding what we're doing to our planet? First of all, there's the fact that our brains are not built to understand climate. Our brains are built to remember weather. We remember that really hot summer or that crazy blizzard or that big storm. I grew up in Toronto and I remember my family talking about Hurricane Hazel even though it happened decades before I was born. None of us are able to add up the temperature and rainfall and humidity and other aspects of weather on every single day of the year at every single weather station in our city, in our province, around the world for not a year, not 10 years, but at least 20 to 30 years because that's what climate is, the average of weather over at least 20 to 30 years, and then fit a trend line through it. We cannot do that in our heads. So we say, it's cold outside, where's global warming now? <laughs> oh yes, we do. <laughs> Or we even say it's cold outside, I'd like a little global warming now. Because that's the way our brains are built. They're working against us. And then there's even more challenging issues. The fact that we use fossil fuels in every part of our lives. I was at a meeting with um, faith leaders a couple of years ago. And one of them said to us, he said, you know what? Every time you get in a car and turn it on, you are sinning. And I'm going to be honest, I just felt like going out to the parking lot and finding a Hummer and just driving in circles around him. <laughs> because to tell me that driving my child to the hospital if he was sick is a sin, to drive myself to work because I live in a place where there is no public transportation and I use my money to support my family and to support the outreach that I do, to tell people that what we do to take care of our families, to take care of others, to supply people's needs is a sin, that is completely counterproductive and just flat out wrong. But at the same time, we can't avoid the recognition that we didn't know back then, when we, you know, during the Industrial Revolution, we didn't know way back then what was going to happen, but we do know now. But it's tough to admit that we're part of it. And then when we look at the scope of the problem, it's overwhelming. I mean, we're talking about the planet here, and I'm just one person. We start to feel a little bit more like this picture when we start to think about what's happening. And then there's just the simple issue that we're really bad at long-term planning. Really bad. I won't ask for any hands, but you know, really, who feels like they have absolutely saved exactly the right amount that they're supposed to for retirement? <laughs> who feels that they always eat exactly what they should and never ever eat something they shouldn't and always exercise the right amount? See, you get where I'm going. We're terrible at long-term planning, even when the solution is obvious. And then we have cultural barriers. Did you know that in 1964, the Pulitzer Prize was awarded to a book on anti-intellectualism in American life? And who are the primary messengers when it comes to a changing climate? The pointy-headed intellectuals, that's who. So this message is coming into a culture where there are already well-trodden paths saying, don't trust those experts. And in fact, as Isaac Asimov, the science fiction writer, said back in the 1980s, and of course we know science fiction writers are actually prophets of our generation, he said, there's a dangerous strain of anti-intellectualism running through our culture that suggests that my opinion is more valid than your facts. That's the world we live in today. That's not the only well-trodden path in our culture. What's the other well-trodden path? It's the one that most of us are probably very aware of and sensitive to, and that is the well-trodden path of those scientists are all godless liberal atheists. I'm going to ask for a show of hands here. Who's heard that before? Okay, if you, okay. If you haven't, just come with me. 
down to Texas. <laughs> no, just kidding. I get it from Canadians, too. <laughs> People feel that if they buy into what the scientists are saying, they have to buy the whole package. They have to buy the ancient earth, they have to buy the Big Bang, they have to buy origins, they have to buy evolution, they have to buy the entire package. Now the reason why I love this conference that's been going on all day, the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation, is because people are actually talking about the real science and how we can really reconcile and struggling with the theology and the science and the culture and seeking truth. But many people are scared. They're scared that they would be giving up too much of who they think they are. And so that's why when I show ice core data showing the history of the earth, my husband suggested to me, he said, well, have you ever seen a figure of the last 6,000 years? And I said, no, there's no scientific reason to show that. And he said, well, why don't you try making the last 6,000 years? So I did. And I use this figure all the time. Because even if we look at the last 6,000 years on our planet, it is crystal clear that something unusual is happening. And to agree that climate is changing, we do not have to agree that the planet is any more than 300 years old. And as far as I know, we all agree on that. <laughs> it's also gotten to the fact where climate change has become one of the hallmarks of belonging to our, our family, our church, our political party. I've had many students, and it absolutely breaks my heart at Christian universities and colleges in the States, say to me, well, I absolutely agree, but I can't share this with my friends. Because they would reject me. It isn't even just a case of cultural connections, it's a case of Climate change is being deliberately painted as a false religion. And when we are approached by a false prophet, what does the true believer do when the false prophet approaches in their wolves or sheep's clothing? We unmask them, we reject them, and so it is no accident that those opposed to the reality of a changing climate, those who receive the largest donations from the fossil fuel industry, he is number one, say climate change is not a science, it is a religion. Because we already have a religion that we're very happy with, and if somebody comes along touting a new religion, what will I do? I will reject it. So we have logistical, economic, psychological, cultural barriers. But today, I think some of the biggest barriers today are political. What do I mean by that? Well, unfortunately, I don't have these for Canada. I would love to see these for Canada. They come from the Pew Political Polarization Survey. It's a lot easier to do it in two dimensions. We would be a little more tricky, right? All these different parties. This is what the political landscape of the United States looked like in 1994. You have the Democrats, you have the Republicans, the means are quite close together, and the distributions are nice and normal. In other words, the most number of people are in the middle, the fewest number of people are out at the edges. And let's step through time. And then they then separated out only the people who actually vote. So this is everybody. But if you look at only people who vote, stunning, isn't it? What does this have to do with our opinions on climate change? Everything. The number one predictor of whether we agree climate is changing and humans are responsible is not how much we know about the science. It is simply where we fall on the political spectrum. That is the number one predictor. If you look at the United States, just before the last election, they did a poll, Gallup did a poll, and they asked people, do you think climate change is mostly human, mostly natural, or not happening? And these were the results. Again, you may be saying, but that's the US. But now you've probably learned. We've got Canada too. This poll uh, was from 2015. I couldn't find a more recent one. But you've got the Conservative Party up top, then you've got undecided, then you've got the Liberal Party in red and the NDP in orange. This is their response to, is there solid evidence that temperature has been getting warmer? And if people answered no, then they counted them. So that's about 30% of conservatives say no. Climate change is one of the most politically polarized issues right now. And vested interests are reinforcing the divide. Jim Hogan, who lives right here in Vancouver, wrote this book, Climate Cover-Up. Naomi Oreskes wrote Merchants of Doubt, and they turned it into a movie, if you're interested in watching. There is a well-funded PR scheme 
that is actually deliberately trying to muddy the waters and attack climate scientists. And I know this because I am one of them. So when we talk about climate change, and Susie the scientist shows up with all of her facts and data, <laughs> what does Calvin respond with? He doesn't respond with facts and data because he feels that he is being personally attacked. And so he responds with his identity. <laughs> And the conversation ends something like this. <laughs> because one of the most dangerous myths that we have bought into is the myth not that the science isn't real. That is not the most dangerous myth. The most dangerous myth is the idea that I have to be a certain type of person to care. If I'm a tree hugger, if I vote green or liberal, green these days, if I bike to work, if I eat granola, if I live on Vancouver Island, then I'm that type of person. But you know, if I'm a fiscal conservative, if I care about the military or the armed forces, if, um, you know, if I'm a Christian, if I'm for, you know, a sensible economy and local jobs, then I'm not that type of person. And we see this reflected in opinions. A few years ago, the American Association of Religion polled people based on how concerned they were about a changing climate, and they divided their answers out by affiliation or denomination. And I know these numbers, or these uh, words are very tiny, so I'll just read them to you. You've got all Americans at the top, and then you have Hispanic Catholics, unaffiliated black Protestants, non-Christians, Jewish, white mainline Protestant, white evangelical Protestant, and white Catholic. Yes, white Catholics actually beat out white evangelicals for the lowest spot. So then you might say, clearly we just need to get the religious leaders to set them straight, right? <laughs> because the Pope, right, encyclical, wrote this big encyclical talking about climate change and poverty and suffering and vulnerable people and the Bible and loving others and Jesus and God and things like that. And it isn't just the Pope. Tom and I were two of the scientists who signed this letter a number of years ago where we wrote that the negative consequences and burdens of a changing climate will fall disproportionately on those whom Jesus called the least of these, the poor, the vulnerable, and the oppressed. And even the Texas version of the Bible, which they publish on road signs, makes this clear. That love thy neighbor thing, I meant it, signed God. But when we look again at this climate change concern index, all of a sudden, this idea that somehow where we go to Sunday or not, church on Sunday or not, affects our opinion about climate change, it starts to unravel. Because the most concerned people group are Hispanic Catholics, and the least concerned people group are white Catholics, and don't they have the same pope? They do, in case you're wondering. <laughs> <laughs> so it isn't who the religious leader is. And along comes my third favorite social scientist, John Evans. They're not ranked in order of favoritism. It's just in the order that they occur in the presentation. John Evans says, all right, it's true that compared to those who aren't actively religious, conservative Protestants are less likely to agree with the climate science. But when you control for demographic properties, it's not, and what John actually said was engaging in fundamentalist behavior. And I said, John, all you mean is going to church. Let's just say going to church. It's not going to church that causes this effect. Instead, opinions are rooted in age, political conservatism, and the Republican Party. Galen Carey is um, the, vice, uh, the government relations director for the National Association of Evangelicals in the U.S., and he nailed it when he said, many evangelicals in the U.S. oppose actions to slow climate change, not on a religious basis, but politically, because they believe the government wants to take away their freedom. I was speaking to a group of water managers in South Texas a couple of years ago, and at the end of the, of the talk, where we had talked a lot about natural variability and El Nino and droughts and floods and long-term trends and how we can prepare for the future, a man got up and, and said, I still remember, he said, you know, I wasn't really on board with this whole thing, but everything you said makes sense. My problem is this. I don't want the government to set my thermostat. I said, you know, I'm with you because I don't want them to either. But that is at the root of the objections. And if you know anything about U.S. politics, you know that there is um, one man, Senator Jim Inhofe, who is so opposed to climate change, they actually wrote a book 
on the global warming hoax. That's a lot of dedication to write a book. But in the same year when he said the arrogance of humans to think that they could affect something as big as this planet, the same year he said this, and it was incredibly revealing. He said, you realize I used to be on your side on this issue when I first heard about it. I was on your side till when? Till I opened the Bible and see what it, to see what it said? No. Till I learned more about the science? No. I was on your side until I found out how much it would cost. The real problem is not with the science. Yes, I know there are sciencey sounding objections all the time. It's just a natural cycle. It's just a tiny amount of carbon dioxide. It's just a tiny amount of white powder. Let me put it in your drink. We hear these all the time. And I know there's religiously sounding objections. God is in control. He said there will always be seasons. The world's going to end anyways. But these are smoke screens for the real problem. So, is there any way to have a productive conversation if this is the case? The answer is a qualified yes. Why qualified? Well, one of my favorite tools I use is the six Americas of global warming. And, and, and you know, let's apply Americas broadly because we are in America also, technically speaking, right? I grew up in, um, when we were nine years old, we moved down to South America, to Colombia, and people would always ask me if I was American. And of course, being Canadian, it's like fingernails on a chalkboard to be asked if you're American. So I would respond, I'm as American as you. And that led to a lot of puzzled discussions. We are all technically living in some form of America. And the six Americas of global warming, what it does is it divides people out. So it's not just yes or no. Too often we paint people as yes or no. It gives us a spectrum of people. You have people who are alarmed. You have people who are concerned, and that's a very big group. You have people who are cautious, and that is also a very big group. Then there's people who are disengaged, those who are genuinely doubtful. And then you have people who are dismissive. And people who are dismissive are people who will dismiss every single piece of evidence which with, with which they are confronted. My definition of a dismissive person is if an angel from God descended with brand new tablets of stone saying global warming is real and foot high letters of flame, they would still dismiss it. Why? Because rejecting the science is an integral part of their identity, so much so that if you know someone who's dismissive, you will know their opinion on climate change because they cannot stop talking about it. In the comment sections, in you know, the messages I get and other climate scientists get, for dismissive people, it is a personal affront to their identity to say that climate is changing and humans are responsible, not because of the science, but because of the implied solutions. But for everybody else, we absolutely can have a conversation. And that conversation does not have to focus on, here's what the science says, do you agree with the science or not? No, because this is not our problem. Our problem is that when you say, do you think climate change will affect you personally? This is what it looks like. And honestly, they didn't do this for Canada, but I, th I think in Canada it would pretty much be darker. In fact, for Alberta, I'm pretty much sure it would be dark blue. <laughs> I'm working with Alberta, and I was just in Alberta, and I'm prepared to swear that almost every single person in Alberta, regardless of whether they support climate policy or not, thinks that climate change will be a good thing for Alberta. Because <laughs> warmer winters and less snow, right? Especially because Calgary went and sold their snow plows to Quebec. There was a lot of mention of that while I was there. Now, if you have very good eyesight, you'll see a couple of orange counties. You know who lives in those orange counties? Think back, who's the most concerned people group in the U.S.? Hispanic Catholics. Mm -hmm. Why do we not think global warming will harm us personally? Because when you see a book or a movie or some type of thing about climate change or global warming, what is the number one image that is on the cover of that book or that DVD or that movie? The number one image is, let's say it all together, a... Thank you, polar bear. Thank you. Exactly. It may be something else now that we're starting to see other impacts, but the number one thing is a polar bear. Now, we're here in Canada, so let me ask you, who here has seen a polar bear in the wild with their own eyes, in the wild? Am I seeing any hands? Wave your hand if you put it up. Oh, I think I see one. Yes. Okay. We are here in Canada, 
and we have like three people who have seen a polar bear in real life. And if this is the number one symbol of a changing climate, honestly, have you been to the Arctic? Give them half of Nunavut and start some seal farms. <laughs> there are things we can do to keep the polar bears from extinction that are a lot less invasive than overturning our entire society, right? And then the second thing, the second big problem, I mean, you thought this one was dark blue, right? There's one more that's even darker blue. Do you ever talk about this thing? No, no one ever talks about it. Why would you care if nobody ever talks about it, right? The extent to which we talk about something communicates how much we care about it. Why don't we talk about it? Well, maybe because we're afraid it might end like this. Maybe we're afraid it might end like this. It's scary. It's depressing. It's overwhelming. I'm just one person. What difference can I make anyways? How can we talk about issues like this in a way that are, is relevant, is current, is constructive? And most of all, and this is where it connects directly to our faith, is hopeful. I think we can do it. And I think this is how we can do it. First of all, rather than starting by what divides us, Start by what unites us. What do we have in common that we genuinely share? And then connect the dots to climate change. Because we genuinely share or genuinely concerned about this, here's why we both might care about climate change from the heart, I'm sure, not from the head. And then last of all, what can we do about it? What can we do to fix it? That is the most important thing to talk about because that's what gives us hope. So let me give you a couple of examples here. What values do we share? Are we hikers? Are we birders? Do we love our children? Are we members of the Rotary Club? The first time I went to speak at a Rotary Club, I'm not a Rotarian, I walked in and I saw this giant banner and I looked at it and I thought to myself, oh my goodness, this is climate change. Is it the truth? Yes. Is it fair to all concerned? Heck no. Would it build goodwill and better friendships to fix it? Yes. Will it be beneficial to all concerned to fix it? Yes. So I took my presentation and I rearranged it around the four-way test. And I gave this presentation to West Texas business people. And I will never forget the local banker who came up to me afterwards with the most bemused look on his face you have ever seen. And he said, you know, I'm not really on board with this whole climate change thing. But it passed the four-way test. <laughs> His attitude was like, what can I say? It must be real. And what deeper value do we share than our faith? Over 85% of people around the world belong to at least one or another major faith tradition, and every single major faith tradition has the same ones that is at the heart of Christianity today, which is the idea of stewardship or responsibility or care for or nurturing of this planet that we have been gifted by God and loving and caring for others who are being harmed, who are suffering, who are vulnerable. This is at the core of our faith. And so here is where the faith and the science starts to intersect because science is like a compass. It can tell us which way is north and south and east and west, but which way is the right way to go? That is the map and the map comes from our hearts. What is written on our hearts? What's written in our hearts is to care about what's happening to others. To care about the fact that when we look at which countries have produced the most carbon, it's all the developed countries, and then we look at which countries are most vulnerable to a changing climate, it's exactly the opposite. We care about a changing climate because it affects real people, especially those who are already on the edge. The reason why I care about a changing climate is because we could be pouring every penny every minute, every ounce of effort we have into a bucket to fix poverty, to fix hunger, to fi fix lack of access to clean water, to fix refugee crises. We could be pouring all of our effort into a bucket to try to fix these massive major humanitarian issues that are causing devastating suffering today, and that bucket has a hole in the bottom, and that hole is climate change, and that hole is getting bigger and bigger. That's the reason why I care about a changing climate, and that reason comes directly from my heart. 
So how can we connect the dots? We can connect the dots by talking about what's happening in the places where we live. Why does it matter if we live on the East Coast where sea level is rising and storms are getting more intense? Why does it matter if we live in the West where beetles are eating millions of acres of forest overwintering as the winters get warmer? Why does it matter up in the Arctic where what used to be permanently frozen ground is thawing and crumbling, putting people and their livelihoods at risk? We can explain why it matters in the places where we live, whether it affects our maple sugar, our forests, our ecosystems, the security of our cities. We even did a study on snowmobiling because it's the foundation of many small communities in the Northeast, in Quebec and Ontario, our agriculture and our farms. We can connect the dots to what we care about. And then we can talk about the solutions. What type of solutions can we talk about? We can talk about what we do ourselves. I, I admit it, I love my light bulbs, I really do. Because you can dial in the exact wavelength and I'm very picky about wavelengths. I got a plug-in car last year and for the first couple of weeks I had it plugged in outside the house. We live on a street where everybody drives these giant Yukons and as they drive by you, if you're outside, they wave, out, you know, they wave like this. They don't roll down the window, they just wave. When they saw this car plugged in outside our house, every single neighbor stopped. They opened the door, they got out of their car, they walked over if we were outside doing something, and they said, what is that? <laughs> I said, it's a car. I said, does it have a gas pedal? Does it have a steering wheel? And we had a great conversation about the gas mileage and how much money we were saving, and they're like, oh my goodness, this is awesome. Where did you get it? And then for a couple weeks afterwards, when they drove by, if we were out there and the car was out there, they'd roll down their window and they'd be like, I love your car. We had a conversation about something that was about saving money. It was cool technology. And this is in the heart of Texas where people love their big trucks. We can talk about what our organizations are doing, like Houghton College, a little Wesleyan college in upstate New York. It has the biggest solar panel array of any educational institution in the entire state of New York. Shame on Cornell. Shame on SUNY. Shame on Columbia. They have been beat by a 1,200-student Christian college. We can talk about climate caretakers, an online Christian community where every month they send you an idea of something you can do, something you can physically do, something you can pray about, something that you can talk to people about. And if you've already done number one, they'll have number two and number three. So if you're interested in knowing what you can do, sign up for climate caretakers today. We can talk about what churches are doing. The fact that Colby May, who graduated from Texas Tech University with a degree in business and then went to Gordon Cornwall Seminary uh, to do uh, missions and ethics. After graduating with a master's degree in missions and ethics, he looked around and he thought, what could I do? He said, I'm going to start an energy audit business for churches, seminaries, and Christian universities to cut their energy use, reduce their carbon footprint, and save money that they can then put into their missions budget. That's pretty amazing. What else can we do? We can talk about what the cities are doing in the places where we live, like Surrey. We can talk about the fact that Alberta has more renewable energy than any other province just about, except Ontario. And this is a map that you can actually find online, this awesome interactive map showing all of the current and new installations of clean energy that are going in in Alberta. I live in Texas. Did you know that in Texas, we got 12% of our energy from wind in 2016. We got 18% in 2017. We're well on our way to 25%. There are 25,000 jobs in the wind energy industry in Texas alone. There's more jobs in the solar energy industry in the US than in the coal industry. Last year, the Museum of Coal Mining in Kentucky put solar panels on the roof. <laughs> Fort Hood is the biggest military base in the U.S., and it went with wind and solar energy. In fact, that's a picture there in the upper left of their installation because they would save taxpayers over $150 million U.S., which is like a trillion dollars Canadian. <laughs> There's little towns like Georgetown, Texas, that went 100% green to save money because three students from the local business program crunched the numbers for them and told them they could save the money. Why not do it? We can talk about how Morocco has the biggest solar farm in the world. How the United Kingdom has the biggest offshore wind farm in the world. How China has more clean energy than any other country in the world and they have crazy stuff like 
panda-shaped solar farms, <laughs> and electric roads, and floating solar farms on top of old coal mines that they flooded. How cool is that? We can talk about how pay-as-you-go solar is revolutionizing sub-Saharan Africa, where nearly a billion people live in energy poverty. They do not have coal and oil in sub-Saharan Africa, but they do have a lot of what? Sun. So when I post on Facebook, I post a lot of things about how India is being affected by climate change, and the Lausanne movement actually listed all the ways India is being affected and all the ways that Christians are actually working in India to help alleviate those effects. And we do global weirding videos on how are poor people going to get energy if not by fossil fuels. The bottom line is that it, without hope, we will be a self-fulfilling prophecy. And where does the hope come from? It does not come from our head. It comes from our heart. For those of us who are Christians, we believe that the hope comes directly from God. We believe that fear is not from God. God has given us a spirit of love and power and a sound mind to make good decisions, Timothy says. So how do we talk about climate? By bonding over shared values, by connecting them to things we care about, and by finding ways that we can work together to act. Because as Jane Goodall, one of my favorite scientists, said, it's only when our clever brain and our human heart work together in harmony that we can achieve our full potential. And as the Bible says, the only thing that really counts is faith expressing itself through love. Thank you. Okay. If you have questions, this is a good time, but if you have more questions, you can always catch me on Facebook or on Twitter, and I answer a lot of questions. During the year when we release our global weirding videos, in the, in the weeks, we release a new video every other week, and the weeks in between, I do live Facebook chats, and we normally get through about 50 questions in half an hour, which is really awesome. It's so fun. We have people from all over the world tuning in to just talk about whatever we're wondering today. So if you don't get a chance in today, it's not your only chance, but if you do have a question right now, Tom has a microphone right there, Arnold has one there, go for it. Hi, I'm Holly. I was just wondering um, if, for example, those in the South, people in the NRA and so forth, um, have a certain kind of discourse pattern and certain words that appeal to them, like liberty and freedom, has the climate change movement thought of ways that they can talk about their, what they're mm -hmm. accomplishing using those discourses? Absolutely. That is a great point. The words that we use matter. I'm a climate scientist, so I can't exactly go around saying I'm not going to talk about climate change. The title gives it away. But two years ago, when I was invited to speak to the Water Managers Association in Texas, and if you think, you know, most people think, oh, well, if you go to church, speak to a church, probably that's the toughest audience. No, it's not my toughest audience. Water managers, tough. So I went to speak to uh, the Association of Water Managers in Texas, and first up, was a state senator who explicitly says climate isn't changing. Next up was the head of a state agency who explicitly does not acknowledge that climate is changing, and then me. So I talked all about climate variability and long-term trends. I talked about El Nino. I talked about how it was getting warmer. I talked about how our rainfall was getting more intense and our droughts were getting stronger. I showed climate projections. For the future, and I talked about resilience, I said everything I would have said, except I didn't say the words climate and change in sequence. <laughs> and at the end, nobody threw any rotten tomatoes. And I will never forget this. You can tell I have the best stories from people who come up afterwards. This woman came running up to me. This woman in a tweed suit came running up to me and grabbed my hand and pumped my hand and said, that was a great talk. I agree with everything you said. Those people who talk about global warming, I don't agree with them at all. But this, this makes sense. <laughs> there is nothing wrong with talking about something using whatever words connect best with people. And so one of the most powerful things I think that people have done is in the Green Tea Party, I don't know if you've heard of that, there's a Green Tea Party, and their position is energy freedom. How freeing is it to pull the plug on the grid? How freeing is it to generate your own power? How freeing is it to never have to actually buy gas again, to never be dependent on oil prices? It's incredibly freeing to be able to generate most of the power that you use by yourself and control it yourself. And so absolutely freedom is something that can and is being used. And it should be. Why not? Right? Mm -hmm. I would like freedom too. Uh, Jeff Strong, I, I'm an atmospheric scientist myself. And one of the biggest problems we have in science is that scientists 
in general, don't talk to the public. Uh, thankfully, there are some exceptions to that, and you're one of the good ones. So would you like to comment on the problem? How you, we can improve on that? Oh, that's a great one. Well, there is a really wonderful organization called Climate Voices, which is run by the National Association or the National Center for Atmospheric Research in the States. Um, and I would love for them to expand over the border because over 200 people have signed up to make themselves available. Um, over 200 scientists and experts have signed up so that people can find somebody local who's interested and willing to talk. But interestingly, they did a study a couple of years ago on a cohort of young interdisciplinary scientists who were very interested in engaged in outreach and were studying climate science. They did a study on 200 of them looking at their personality analysis, and they discovered that that group of very engaged and outreach-minded um, scientists had a distinctly different personality type than the average public that made them very good scientists, but made it very difficult for them to communicate in concrete and simple terms. So people often say, well, what should scientists be doing? And my answer is, I don't think there is a should. There are some people who are absolutely well within their rights to chain themselves to fences, and people do. There are others who go around talking to public groups like I do. Then there are some who should never step foot outside the ivory tower and who should possibly never talk to anybody outside the field because it would just make things worse. But they are brilliant at what they are do doing and they're helping us understand this planet that we live on through the research that we do. So there really is this entire spectrum. And when you talk about engaging in outreach too, well, it could be speaking, but it doesn't have to be these days. It could be writing. It could be photography or art. It could be doing tiny little tweets on social media. There's a lot of Instagram accounts now. It could, there's so many different ways to reach out and engage with people, and there's so many different um, levels to do it at an individual church, with your kids or your grandchildren's school, with local community groups, with the city or the community itself. Sometimes I've just made myself available. I've said, you know what, hey, if you ever want somebody, I'm here, I'd be happy to engage. And sometimes they say, no, thank you. And sometimes they say, oh, really? I didn't know we had somebody like this here. And then, you know, people take you up on it. So if you're interested in reaching out, I would just encourage you to let people know you're available. That's the first step. Thank you. We've got a question over here. Yeah, Catherine, thank you. Um, a question that I'm not sure because I haven't followed this up, but cryptocurrencies um, seem to be pretty energy intensive. You were just talking about use of language, and it just hit me a couple of weeks ago when, when this was in the news. They were talking about data mining, about, about mining in yeah. cryptocurrency. And I, I don't know if you want to comment on that, because it's that use of language that just seems quite remarkable. Uh, it, mining of cryptocurrency sounds benign. And but it seems to be apparently one of the most energy intensive kinds of utilizations. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is, the question is technology. Technology has gotten us into this. What's the way we can, can move yeah. out? <laughs> yes. I mean, electric cars, of course, but there must be much more in terms of re-engineering mm -hmm. our society. The challenge here, and, and this relates to my, the first barrier, which is logistics, is there's no one silver bullet. For transportation, we might be going electric. For aviation, electric is not going to cut it. Now, there are some electric planes. You can Google them. But large-scale commercial aviation, no, that is a pipe dream. But they are looking at growing algae out of CO2, and they can turn the algae into biofuel that they can actually run a plane on without modifying it all. In fact, United Airlines flies flights out of LAX on algae biofuel already today. You might have been on one of those flights, and you didn't even know it. Pretty cool, isn't it? So at the same time that there are so many different opportunities, and one of the, my most favorite opportunities, actually, is one I have not even mentioned, and that is the opportunity to put carbon back in the soil where it's a good thing. Carbon in the soil is good for us. Um, burning agricultural waste at high temperatures and producing what they call biochar and plowing that back into the soil, it's like miracle grow on steroids, as one ag, ag expert told me. So there are absolutely amazing, innovative things that we can do. And so both the blessing and the curse 
is that there's a million different bullets, but there's a million different bullets. So there's no one thing that'll fix it all, but at the same time, every once in a while, we shoot ourselves in the foot, and cryptocurrency is definitely a shot in the foot. Because why? Do you know how much computer processing time it takes to generate one of those unbreakable codes? Enormous amounts, like approaching that of a small country. All of a sudden, we have a new country in the world, and it is the cryptocurrency country in terms of its energy consumption. Now, you might say, ultimately, if they could power it all off wind, like Facebook is actually powered off wind now, and Apple, as we saw, already is. If they could power it all off renewables, you know, that might help. But even with renewables, you say, okay, but what do we do with the wind turbines when we're phasing them out? Nobody's ever recycled a wind turbine before. Tesla recycles their batteries in their cars, which is pretty cool. But for every solution that we think of, there is always a, ooh, but what about? Somebody figured out that you could turn carbon dioxide into baking soda, but the amount of baking soda you'd have to create to actually take enough carbon dioxide of the atmosphere would pretty much create almost a new Australia. <laughs> so, so this is tough. It is messy. It is complicated. There is no one right answer. But at the same time, there are dozens and hundreds and thousands of amazing answers around the world that are already happening today. And that is why on my Facebook page, I always try to post at least one cool, hopeful thing every week because we need to know that it's not a giant boulder that we need to roll uphill and there's no hands on that boulder. The giant boulder is already starting to roll down the hill and there are millions of hands on it. And those hands come from every country in the world. Thank you. Do we have time for one more? Okay, read over here. Hi, Catherine. Hey. My name is Lena. Sorry, that was loud. Were you the polar bear person? Oh, you were. Okay, somebody very brave was like, polar bears. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. We can do two for one, I guess. All right. No. I, I do have a number of questions, and I don't have Facebook or Twitter. But, okay. Uh, but anyhow. Um, just also, I have a website, which is just my name, katherinehayhoe.com, and I have a lot of stuff on the website, so Great. that's also a good place to go. Okay. I was, I was curious about what that sole error was in the 38 studies. Um, that you talked about that contradicted climate change happening? Sure. Um, it was, let me go back there so you can actually see what we're talking about here. Um, let me be clear, and I'm glad you asked that question so I can clarify. Um, it, it wasn't a single error. Um, every paper had usually a different error. There was an assumption, or sometimes an actual mathematical error, or sometimes they left out something. It was a different one every time. There wasn't one specific error that everybody did. But we found at least one error in every single one that if we corrected it, that it would bring it in line with the science. So it was very interesting. All right, thank mm -hmm. you. Have, have they done hydrogen, like planes um, running on hydrogen? Um, the space shuttle does, and <laughs> there's some things that happen because of that. Um, the, the hydrogen is definitely something they're looking at for vehicles, um, but in terms of our own personal transportation, um, you have to compress it. There's a lot of, you know, and then the refueling. They tried it in California for a while. It didn't really take off. Electric is sort of taking over now with the new battery technology that they have. It used to be that Tesla was the only car with, you know, multiple hundred miles of range. And now you're seeing um, American car manufacturers, Nissan, Leaf. You're seeing all these incredible cars pop up that have much larger ranges. And so electric is really starting to take over, um, which is interesting. I was at a conference um, a couple months ago with a guy from MIT, and you know what he said? He said, in 30 years, 95% of people in North America won't even own a car because we'll have flying Ubers that show up at the door. I was like, flying electric Ubers? <laughs> so, thank you. So this will be the last question, last question. over well, here. Or oh, was there a bonus question over there for the polar bear? Okay, go yes, ahead. Okay. Polar bear she deserves a question. She's the one who really yelled it out. Yes. Me now? Okay. Um, so my question is the, this is real, this is us, this is serious. I feel like the first two are kind of checked for me. The, the this is serious one, I didn't see much from you to kind of touch on that, but I think that's the one where I feel like climate modeling, this is just me as a, an, I don't know enough about this, this, but just from what I know, it seems like climate science, there you can't have a model that can take into account all the variables and, and, and know where they're all going to head. And so I just wonder if there's truly, if there's consensus among climate scientists for where the projections are going. I've heard things like, yeah, but the increased cloud will increase the albedo and therefore actually promote a cooling. And mm -hmm. so I don't know. 
Do you know what I'm asking? Oh, yeah, I absolutely do. Okay. Yes, yes. And, you, and you're asking a very good question. So first of all, I would point you to this resource right here, which is an amazing resource because it addresses a lot of these questions. So, so definitely bookmark Skeptical Science because they have lots of good articles on this. Um, the, the question of as it gets warmer, are we going to get more clouds that reflect more solar energy? It was actually a theory that was proposed by Richard Lindzen um, the year I was born, which was very interesting. Back then, it was a very viable um, theory because we didn't have any evidence or data for whether which types of clouds would form and where, and that matters very much. The elevation of the clouds, the composition of the clouds, and the geographic location of the clouds determines whether they have a net cooling or warming effect. But fast forward more than four decades now, and we have satellite observations of four decades of change, and we know now that the cloud feedback is unfortunately to amplify the warming rather than to ratchet it down. So in, um, in this study that I talked about, they looked at all of the projections scientists had made over the past 20 years, and they compared it to what really happened, and they found a systematic bias in one direction, that we were underestimating the change. And, and when I wrote this report here that I referenced earlier, and I would refer you also to this, um, chapter 15 is the one where we, the last chapter is the one where we write about what we are not sure about, what we know we don't know, and what we know that we, we don't know that we don't know. I have to think about that for a minute. And in that chapter, we concluded that we know that our climate models have a systematic bias. And we know, comparing our climate models, because the interesting thing people don't realize is, you actually take the models and people apply them to Mars, they apply them to Venus, they apply them to paleoclimates, they apply them to all different situations for which we have data. And when you look at paleoclimates, we realize that the models are systematically underestimating the rate of long-term change. That there are mechanisms that we do not understand that are not in the models today, and once we figure out what those are, those are going to give us larger amounts of change than we saw in the past. But over this century, the most important thing, I think, to highlight, and this is a really good thing to highlight, is the biggest uncertainty in the future is our choices. Whether we follow a higher or lower path or something in between, it's not a physical uncertainty. It's not limited by how much we know about the planet. Whether we go up or down, whether we go higher or low or somewhere in the middle, is entirely up to our choices. And so that's why we don't make predictions. We can't make predictions. Who can predict human behavior? Nobody can. We develop projections. If we choose to do X, here's what it would look like. If we choose to do Y, here's what it would look like. If we choose to do Z, here's what it would look like. Sorry, Z. Z's just gotten easier to say. <laughs> um, and the interesting thing is, it's a little bit like Schrodinger's cat, because People say, well, which of these is the most likely scenario? And I say, well, if we never studied the impacts, clearly the top one. But by studying the impacts, we are actually changing the probability of which pathway we follow. Isn't that interesting? So that's why we can't answer which is the most likely future, because we are the biggest uncertainty. How can we address that uncertainty? By making sure that we have the choices and the information that we need to make good choices that will actually benefit us and others. And if you want to know more on my YouTube channel, which is, again, just my name, you can easily find my YouTube channel, I have a lot of different types of talks where I talk a lot more about the impacts. So this talk was more about why are we kind of in this situation, how does science relate to this in faith? But if you look for a couple of my other talks, there's, um, I go into a lot of detail because that's what I actually study is local climate impacts on specifically what it means for our agriculture, our water resources, our energy, our economy, our health, national security, um, refugee crises, um, even political instability can be affected by a changing climate. So there's a lot to unpack there. Thank you. So I've got the last question over here, then I'll make a couple of closing remarks, and then we can get to our food and drink. Oh, yes. All right. Thank you. I'm Dave. I'm a pastor, and I'm in a very conservative part of the Fraser Valley. And people are very sincere, but I believe they're sincerely wrong. Uh, they are like Scott Pruitt in the APA, and they want to hold to the idea that if climate change is real, it will hasten the return of Jesus. And the issue that really troubles me is, how do you engage in that when they're so sincere and where they're coming from? And I wonder if you have any, any ideas. Yes. Um, in fact, when, when we did our Global Weirding series that I talked about earlier, one of those episodes says the Bible doesn't talk about climate change, does it? 
And in that episode, we address all of the most common religiously sounding objections we hear, which is God's in control, so nothing can happen. The world's going to end anyway, so why does it matter? In fact, it could even speed it up. Um, as well as, you know, the in-between stuff like, um, you know, God gave us dominion, so that means we can just do whatever we do. And you know what's so interesting? This is a PBS series, so it's not, you know, it's not a Christian series, and we're on all, it's on all different topics, but I wanted to do one on what does the Bible say about climate change, and the answer, of course, is nothing. The Bible doesn't say climate change, but it also, it talks a lot about our attitudes and actions, which reflect on climate change. And you know what's so interesting? That episode is the most watched episode Everybody wants to watch that episode. Christians are not Christians. Everybody's like, oh my goodness, what does the Bible say about climate change? So, so in that video, I do, um, I do answer that question briefly, and the answer does not at all come from science. The answer has to come from the same source of authority that we're referencing, which is the Bible. The amazing thing, of course, is that there's, no, there's nothing new under the sun. And so, of course, back then, in New Testament times, People were saying, well, the earth is going to end, the, Jesus is returning any day now anyways, and they were quitting their jobs, and they were laying around, and in the book of Thessalonians, Paul writes to those people, and he says, essentially, get a job. <laughs> get off your rear. <laughs> you know, we're called to care for the widows and the orphans, you know, support your family, don't be a drag on the church, I'm paraphrasing here. But it's fascinating because even back then, people were saying, well, the world's going to end anyway, so why does it matter? And the answer is not science. The answer is not economics. The answer is we have been given good works to walk in here on this earth. We have been given a new heart so that we can share God's love with others. We have a purpose for our physical existence, and the physical existence of Jesus was so important. There were entire books of the Bible written about the physical existence. And so if we really believe that this planet was a gift from God to sustain our physical life, if we believe that we are to love others as Christ loved us, then how can we not be at the front of the line to help our suffering sisters and brothers around the world? I just came from a missions conference where I talked about the intersection between poverty and vulnerability. I, talked, I unpacked every single issue that affects poor people today. Hunger, disease, lack of access to clean water, political instability. And every single one of those issues is being exacerbated by a changing climate. How can we not care? Our hearts are built to go out to, and care for people in that situation. So... Thank you. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>